So good to see you tonight. It's good to see so many. I feel like I've made a lot of new friendships, new acquaintances this week. It means a lot. We've come to the end of it, in my opinion, rather quickly, maybe not so much from, from that side of things. But to me, it's just gone so fast and I've enjoyed it so very much. Thank you for your kindness. There's so many people that I'd love to thank here, but I know the, the secret to being invited back is you just got to keep it short on the last night. I mean, that's in the book. If you want any shot at all. So that's my hope. I brought a secret weapon with me for that. Summer, my wife Summer is here, and so she can give me the, you know, the move when, uh, when it's time to be done. But if you haven't met Summer yet, I hope that you do. I'm so thankful that she gets a chance to meet you. Uh, so a lot of times I head home for meetings, and I'm just trying to describe people and tell them about these wonderful experiences, and it's just neat that she gets to, to put the faces with the name. So thanks for that. I want to thank the eldership here. I appreciate them putting faith in me to come and speak. I need you to understand that I do not take that lightly at all. The idea that your sheep sit and listen to someone come and share the Word of God. I'm thankful to Mitch and Jason and Dale and Dave and the Rick that I got to meet and the Rick that maybe I didn't get to meet this time but hope to in the future. I know that you feel very, very secure with leadership like this. There is nothing as advantageous to the future of a church than strong biblical leadership. Uh, also, Sean, I knew Sean from Texas. Good to see Sean out here in Phoenix and his family, and he loves being here. And uh, interesting time to come to a new work, uh, to go through the COVID year. You know, probably you won't advise that in the future. Uh, not, that, not that you had any, any way of knowing, but, you know, he's been here about a year and a half, and it just seems really rich for him. And I love to see preacher friends smiling and optimistic and thankful. And, of course, she's always smiling. She's super sweet. Uh, Gigi, but uh, it's good to see him doing the same, and, and I hope that, that you're enjoying having him here, and I know that you are. Uh, as we get to the end of this, I need you in John 3, a couple of things here. I made a, a change to what we were going to talk about tonight. Sometimes when I spend a few days with a local church and have some conversations, it affects specifically the way that you might finish a meeting. So, you know, we, we started with two lessons on Sunday that I brought purposefully to match your great theme that you've had going over the last 12 months, this idea of finding Jesus and connecting to Christ and really flourishing in the knowledge of the Son of God. You've been doing that all year. It's the best thing you could have possibly done in a year like the one that we've had and probably in the year to come. And so we talked about that. We looked at Jesus in Revelation and Genesis. And then the last two nights was a little bit different. It was kind of like, okay, if you're really connected to Christ, let's prove it then. Let's live the kind of lives that shows people that I live for Jesus Christ above all else. So we talked about two things. We could have done a hundred different things, but we talked about emptying ourselves of ourselves. We talked about assessing all the weaknesses in your character and getting yourself out of the middle of that. We did that on Monday night. And then last night we talked about the true fruit of discipleship. Disciples make disciples. And I hope that you'll have this vision of yourself going through the rest of the year, showing how much you're growing in Jesus by the amount of people with whom you share the word of God. Teaching is a great sign of growth. And I was going to do that with one more tomorrow, uh, tonight. I was going to talk to you about the, the math problem. Another way that God's people can indicate their spiritual growth is by actually taking the money out of their pockets and giving it to people who need it. Did you know that? Would you be surprised to know that Jesus literally said to sell your possessions and give to charity? So I wanted to preach that, but I thought, you know, I don't want to just keep throwing stuff at you guys. I want to cycle back. And I just want to connect you back to Jesus tonight. It's great to have things you're working on. It's great to be challenged and have goals. But unless you are flourishing emotionally and intellectually in your relationship with Christ, these sermons fade within a week or two. Unless you got the Christmas cup, then they won't fade for you. But otherwise, they fade. But you know what doesn't fade? Like this passion for Jesus. So if you're interested in listening to the math problem, I've got it on the Excel Still More podcast from a couple of weeks ago. And if you want a big old 50-minute sermon, I think there's one of those on the website from a couple of weeks before that. But tonight, let's go to somewhere else, somewhere more important. Let's talk about the death the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. And more than just the event, you know what happened. You don't need a history lesson on what happened tonight. I want to know what kind of a connection you have made with what happened. Are you emotionally connected with the events of Jesus' crucifixion? 
Do you intellectually grow in an understanding of what it means? That's where we're going tonight. It won't take long to do. We'll be looking at almost all really familiar Bible passages. Tonight isn't about stretching you into a new direction in a passage. It's about just making sure on the inside that your love for him is what it needs to be. Uh, there's a song that we sing. I noticed the lyrics just slightly different tonight, but we will be leading it in just a few minutes. There's a song entitled, Were You There? Are you familiar with that song? It asks a really interesting question because we already know the answer. In fact, it's kind of a silly question. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? No. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? I said no. Three times we're asked this question, and in the middle, this impactful line, I, I just hum it all the time now, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? And all the verses follow that, and you'll see some of those lyrics tonight. Of course, the answer is no for me. The answer is no for you, and the answer is no for the person who wrote this song. But then again, the answer should also always be yes. There should be such an absolute personal connection, not only what you know about the event, but also what you feel about the event and what you know about its significance that never leaves you. And at any moment, you can close your eyes, no matter where you are in your life, and you can see him dying for you. And it can put you right where you need to be. We're going to talk about establishing that tonight. And I hope to help you do that. An example of how this might work, a couple of years ago, Summer and I were in Dallas for a night and we were looking for something to do and we went and visited the George W. Bush Museum. You guys know that George W. Bush was president during 9-11 in 2001, which Mr. Mitch and I talked about tonight. And we walked in and we were looking at all the presidency stuff and then we entered into that room. You guys ever seen a room like that? I've not been up to New York. I wasn't there. But you walk into this room and you see these twisted metal pieces that they have placed there. And, and you begin to think about, you see the pictures of the faces and you start reading the story. So you're like, emotionally, you're there. Then you start adding intellect to it by reading the stories of what the people did. And I mean, not only were Summer and I sobbing, not a single person in the facility could refrain from falling apart in that way. And the question is, is that the kind of experience you have when you think about the sacrifice of your savior because it needs to be and nothing we charge to do can exist without it so what we're going to do tonight is really simple just want to look at a few of these verses with you the first verse in the songbook back home is were you there when they nailed him to the tree were you there when jesus died and and if you were there i just want to ask you what would you say would have struck you about that and of course, not actually being there, you're having to imagine it from here. So let me rephrase the question. As you sit here in this building, years later, on the other side of the world, when you think about Jesus dying on a cross, what does it make you feel and why does it matter? Christians should always be able to tell people why the death of Jesus matters to them. So if we had little cards, I really wish we did tonight. I wish I could give you three little cards and say, okay, card number one is the death of Jesus. Write down three reasons why it matters to you and never forget those three things. But you don't get a chance to do that tonight, so you're just going to have to listen to my three. For each of these, and I believe that we will align on this. Are you in John chapter three? The number one most significant thing that affects us about the death of Jesus and his dying on a cross is that it proved the depths of the nature of, of the Father's love for us. God made us out of love. God blessed us here out of love, but greater love can no man show than you might lay down your life. I think the second greatest amount of love you could show is laying down your life for someone who hates you, but harder than that would be laying down the life of your child. You remember when we were referencing Genesis 22 on Sunday? How Abram had his son, his only son, whom he loved and almost had to offer him. But there was a ram in his place, and there was no ram for God. John 3 is helpful in this way. In John chapter 3 and in verse 16, but in the verses that follows, John 3 and 16, For God so loved the world, sinful world, 
that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. I know you know verse 16, but are you familiar with verse 17? Why didn't he send his son to judge the world? We deserved to be judged. We had rejected every prophet he had sent. They had turned from him in every conceivable way. He should have sent his son to judge us all and start it all over. And he did the exact opposite of that. He sent his son to be judged by us. Can you believe that? That he would die in innocence so that we could escape judgment and he could reform us. Verse 18, he who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. As you read through this, look in verse 21. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought of God. I just wanted to make this point really quickly. Wrought is a word that drew my attention this last week. God wants to reshape you. He wants to change you and build you and construct you. And this word means to reform and reuse. That's built on your understanding of his love. On nothing else is it built. It's not built on your courage. It's not built on your righteousness. It is built on your reaction to his love. God said, I can do a lot of great things with someone who knows how much I love them. There are three things we can say about the death of Jesus. And as you'll see in all three categories tonight, the first has to do with those who are outside of our sight. In this case, the love of God. But I'll show you a second thing. Go to Isaiah 53, which we read often. A second thing that we learn and must never forget from the death of Jesus is that Jesus in his dying carried an impossible load on behalf of disciples. You know, his disciples did not understand this. They thought he was going to march his way into Jerusalem and that they were pretty good people. They thought they were really great people, actually. They all thought they were the greatest people, I guess. If you really want to get down to their arguing. But they thought that Jesus would go and he would establish himself on the throne. And because they were such good followers, they would get to sit in glory. And they completely missed the fact, listen carefully, that no matter how good they were, they were never going to be good enough. No matter how righteous we are, no matter how many good works we do, we would never do enough to be worthy of fellowship with our Creator. Do you know that about yourself? Not a single thing can do it. And so what Jesus taught them in his death is, I have to give my life as a blood sacrifice to carry your sins away because you'll never be good enough to erase them. And that's why we read Isaiah 53 so often. Look in Isaiah 53 in verse 4. Just listen to this language. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Verse 11. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, and he will bear their iniquities. If you ever want another way of looking at Isaiah 53 and just the four verses we read, go in and mark out all of the plural pronouns and put personal ones. I could read it all again. Surely my griefs he bore. He carried my sorrows. He was crushed for my iniquity. He's righteous, verse 11, and I am not. If we ever lose this connection to understanding that only because he died could I ever be justified, it'll change everything. You say, well, be careful preaching that, Chris. You preach that too much and people are going to think that works don't matter because they'll never be good enough. You just pay attention. Only a fool would think that. Only a fool would think, because Jesus died to free me from my sin, I can go out and sin now. You don't know Jesus. You don't have the first inkling of an understanding of what he suffered. If him carrying sin away would ever justify you living in it. That's Romans 6, isn't it? But what I learned when I think about this is that it proved how much God loved me 
And he carried a burden that would have never been taken away and guilt would have ridden my life and riddled it forever. And by the way, if you're someone who carries a lot of guilt, we've got people in the church like that. They carry tons of guilt over mistakes that they've made. They really can never truly get over it. It's always just burdening them, holding them back. I could preach to you about guilt and forgiveness and your life, but all you really need to know is that he's a lot stronger than you give him credit for being. And his death did more than we can even imagine. Let me give you a third thing that relates to our conversion. Go with me to Colossians 3, please. Colossians chapter 3. The death of Jesus shows these things, but it also led me, and I pray you as well. It led me to die to my sins in order to honor his sacrifice. Sometimes I think Christians think if I'm not dying to my sin, then maybe I need another sermon on how bad that sin is. Sean, how's that work out for us? Shepherds here, how's that work out? Somebody suffering from a sin problem, we'll just keep preaching on it. We'll just keep grinding on that thing until they finally get it. They already get it. The problem is they don't get Jesus. Because when you do, you understand that his death leads to my death. I die to sin in his honor, and it is a privilege to do so. Colossians 3 is so helpful with this. Look in Colossians 3, beginning in verse 3. For you have died, talking to Christians like us, you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Now watch this. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it's because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. He said, that's not you anymore. You have a new life. Christ died for you. Now it's your turn to die. I'm so thankful that I don't have to physically die in order to find a relationship with Jesus, aren't you? I'm certainly thankful that I don't have to sacrifice my son in order to have a physical and spiritual relationship with God. But he has asked me to die to the old life of sin in his honor. And that's what we need to do. And can I just say a little something here since we're here? She's about, starting, she's about to start going like this. We're going to talk about baptism tonight before we're done. I mean, how can you talk about the death, burial, and resurrection without talking about baptism? But I didn't start with it. It's not here. It's not in the first set of points. You know, we baptize our kids kind of young. I'm not against baptizing them young. We baptize people rather quickly. I'm not totally against that. In Acts 2, they were baptized quickly. But sometimes I fear that we bury people alive. Does that statement make sense to you? They've not died to anything. They're not dead to the old life. They're not ready to kill the old them. They just want to be baptized and have their sins forgiven. We're burying them alive. We need to make sure that people are ready to die to that life. And if you return to it, you put it to death anew. Because that's what it means to honor the death of the Son of God. Now, once we do that, we can start talking about what comes next. And, and I'll say this about this next verse. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Of all the sermons that have ever been preached about the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus, this one doesn't get a lot of sermons. Have you noticed that? Sean, let me know how many sermons you've got on this. He's probably got a few. We talk about the death and all those connections, and we talk about the resurrection. But if I ask you right now on a sheet of paper, just write down, like when you think about Jesus being brought down off of the cross and placed in a tomb, and the stone rolled there, and those hours passing, Friday and Saturday up to Sunday morning, like, what is the significance of that period of time to you? Why does that matter to you? Why do we talk about it? Well, let me give you a few things to think about. In the first point, I told you that his death showed the love of God, and it did, but this is where the devil joins into the picture. Open your Bible with me to 1 Corinthians, please, chapter 15, 1 Corinthians 15. When I think about those hours when Jesus was in the grave, it occurs to me that it was Satan's one, only, best chance to stop all of this. God shows the love, allows his son to die, steps back, leaves the body in the grave, and challenges the devil to do one thing, keep the body in the grave. Not for a month or a year, for three days. You get to day four and Christianity is a farce. The empty tomb changed everything. And, and you know, this language is shown to us in 1 Corinthians 15. 
Now, ultimately, 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, is about the resurrection. But before you get there, you have to have this period of the burial and what happened next. So what if, what if Jesus had stayed in that tomb? What if we would have had this great shepherd, John 10, who died to save the sheep and then stayed dead? It would not have been a good story, and we wouldn't be here tonight to talk about it. Here's how that's described. Have you ever read this before? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, let's start in verse 12. Now, if Christ has preached that he's been risen from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, listen to this list. If the, if, if the burial was the end of it, everything you're about to read becomes instantly true. Our preaching is vain. Your faith is vain. The apostles' witnesses are false because they've already testified and it would have been against God that he had raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ is raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. And maybe worst of all, you're still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ, you know the ones we, we rejoice over? We shouldn't be because they perished. And if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, you know, like you and I have done, put all of our hope into Christ, verse 19, we are of all men most to be pitied. Everything about who we are and what we stand for. I get a little perturbed sometimes when people say, you know, even if, people in the church say this, even if this isn't real, at least the Christian life is a good moral life. Stop talking about that. If Christ was not raised from the dead, this is all a joke. There's a hundred ways to go out and enjoy your life. You can do it with Christ or without, morally or immorally. Let's not act like, well, without this, we still get, without this, you got nothing. If the burial is the end of the story, we're the worst of the worst because our hope is built on nothing instead of nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. He gave him his best shot. And you know, that shot was felt. This may not have a lot to do with you, this second point. I made in the, in the first point this idea that, that his death carried away the impossible burden for the disciples, but his burial was a test. Do you think you would have passed that test? You've been serving Jesus. You've watched him work miracles. I mean, in his defense, he'd already raised some people from the dead, but you didn't expect him to die. You watch him die, and they put him in the tomb, and you're thinking any minute, and then boom, the, the stone rolls over it. It was the greatest test of faithfulness that the disciples ever experienced. And can I just say something? They failed that test. Do you remember that? Look in Mark chapter 16 and Mark 16. Listen to the language that's given to us here, beginning in about verse 9. Mark 16 and verse 9. Maybe not a complete failure, but maybe you can put it that way. Because in verse 9 and the text that's around it, we learn that they went and hid. They locked themselves in a house and hid. They were afraid for their lives. Now, after he had risen early on the first day of the week, Mark 16, 9, he first appeared to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She goes and she reports to those who had been with him while they were mourning and weeping. When they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they refused to believe it. This burial has had a horrific impact on their trust in God. They refused to believe it. After that, he appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking along on their way to the country. They went away and they reported it to others. They didn't believe them either. Afterwards, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclined at the table and he reproached them for their unbelief and their hardness of heart because they had not believed those who had seen him after he had risen. Now, he was very upset with them because he had a mission to send them on. The mission is found in verses 15 and 16. I need you to go and preach the gospel to all the world. I need you to preach to people to be baptized into me, and I'm going to send you these signs, but how can I send you? I was in the grave just a, a mere period of hours, and you're afraid and you're hiding. You know, I just have to say that the burial of Jesus was a dark and dangerous time. And the disciples felt it. And lest I judge them too severely, I think about what I would have done. But let me say this in their defense. They were very different people after Jesus came back. 
Once they learned that not even a stone over a dead man's body grave could stop Jesus, they were changed forever. So can I say a little something to you while you read that? That's a true statement. But it should not be your life. We're not sitting around here going to church on a Wednesday night while the body of Jesus lays in a tomb and we sure hope it disappears before Sunday. That's not the life that we live. We live a life of resurrection and hope. I will say, and I would be kind of getting off task a little bit, but I will say that we do, we do bury people, don't we? We bury people. They die and we bury them. And we don't see them the next day. And we don't see them the day after that. And we may not see them the year after that or the decade after that. But the text says if they died in faith, they will be raised again. We face tests like this as well when it comes to departure and death. But as you'll see as we move forward, there was something more to it. And it could not stop him. Let's talk about baptism a little bit. Can't talk about the burial without talking about baptism, can we? What we learn from the death of Jesus is I'm going to die to sin because he died to take away sin. What we also learn is that he was willing to go down into the grave to subject himself to a full burial. And so that has led me to be buried with Christ in the water. Aren't you thankful it's not a grave? I'm so thankful it's not a grave. You want to talk about a test of faith? How about the invitation tonight? You want to be one with Christ? Let's go die out in a field in a grave. God has been so merciful to us that he wants us to simply connect with that burial in water. Now, there are two passages. I want to see if you can guess the one we're going to. There are two passages in the New Testament that reference the burial of Jesus and our part in it. The first one is Romans 6, which I'm saving for the last point. Do you know the other? Open your Bibles with me to Colossians, please. Colossians, as you probably know, Colossians and Ephesians are very similar. The language is very similar. I want you to see it in this text because I love the connection with Christ language. Go to Colossians chapter 2, please. And I want to begin, uh, let's begin in about, uh, well, I just want to begin in chapter 1, verse 1 and read the whole thing. But I, I okay, I got to know from over there. Okay, so let's just start in chapter 2. Let's start in chapter 2, verse 8. Now, you're obviously going to get to some baptism stuff, but before you get there, I want you looking for some terms. In him and with him. Will you be looking for that with me? In him and with him. We started our series talking about getting connected to Christ in the word, and now you're really going to get connected to Christ in the most impactful way possible. Let's read it together beginning in verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in him, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And in him, you have been made complete. And he is the head over all rule and authority. And in him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the workings of God who raises him from the dead. He goes on to say, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. I want to be with Christ, don't you? I want to be in him. I want to be connected to him. I want to draw nourishment from the vine as a branch, I want to draw energy and power, then you need to be connected with him in his burial. And that's what baptism is for someone who becomes a child of God. This is the last night of the meeting. Probably not going to see me for a little while. So I really feel it important to make this plea to you. If at any point when you're looking at these bottom figures, the last one was, we've got to die to our sins before we can be buried with Jesus. If you, you've been baptized maybe, but you didn't die to your sins. Would you think very strongly about connecting with Christ in the way that he's demanded tonight? You say, well, what do you mean by that? I say that when we're buried in that water, it's because we chose to cut something away and we went down in that water, not after we were saved, not to be added to some church. You know how all that goes. We did it because of what he did. And because by grace that only he provides, he says, I'll let you come and I'll let you do this with me. And what it represented for me will be experienced in you. And you don't have to die physically, but you must be born again. 
of the water and the Spirit. That's what the burial of Jesus means to me. It's a change, a passing from one life to the other. You can't get to the new life without burying the old. Well, that leads us to our third and final set. Were you there when God raised him from the dead? The answer is no, literally, but it needs to be yes on a Monday. It needs to be yes at 740 on a Wednesday night. It needs to be yes on a Friday. Like every day of your life, the answer should be yes. I'm always there. Because that first day of the week, early that morning, when Jesus came forth and appeared to Mary and then the disciples, everything in the history of the world was forever changed. Remember what I said early on, his, his death was the showing of God's great love. He can't show any more love than that. The burial was Satan's big shot to win the game. But the resurrection, the resurrection proclaimed a victory. I want you to listen carefully or read carefully those three things. Those are three scary things. If I gave you another sheet of paper and said, write down the three scariest things there, there is, you'd probably write down the devil and sin and, of course, death. When Jesus was raised from the grave, Genesis 3, we talked about Genesis 3 Sunday morning. In the garden, we were told that Satan would crush his heel. And didn't he, though? The disciples were shattered. They had a heel-like faith. They were shattered. But in the resurrection, Christ crushed Satan, sin, and death and destroyed their power forever. But not for everyone. Only those who are in him. Only those who are with him. Jesus did this great thing. Go back to 1 Corinthians 15. We get to read some better parts we read the part a little while ago in the burial point about in 1 Corinthians 15, if, if Jesus didn't come out of the grave, like everything's a waste. But of course, that wasn't the point of that chapter, was it? The point picks up in verse 20. But now, and I pray you can say this with not 99% confidence, with 100% confidence. Uh, I'll just say one thing really quickly here before I read this. It has become common language in the church to assume that all of our teenagers and all of our older folks and middle-aged folks, and family, that, that all of us believe. And we all have just tons of faith. The problem is living it's hard. And I think a lot of that gets, sort of seeps into our preaching and our Bible classes. We know everybody's got a ton of faith. It's just that we've got to figure out like the tips and strategies. Oh, here I go. I'm going to sell out the ESM pocket. The tips and strategies for how you're supposed to do it. Listen, I don't believe that. I believe that there are people who've been in the church a really long time who are operating on less than 100% absolute confidence that Jesus was raised from the grave. And every percent of confidence you lose in that opens up a plethora of disasters in your walk. We need to spend a little more time, in my opinion, and in my work, focusing on verses like this. Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who are asleep will all be raised because he was raised. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. And he goes on to explain that and how that, that death, verse 26, would be this enemy that would be abolished. Adam brought sin into the world and man followed with their sin and they died. Christ brought new life. And everybody who follows in his footsteps will receive the benefit of that. Go to verse 52. Let's do verse 50. 1 Corinthians 15. Christ has been raised and there is a real moment coming. It's real. I've got some preterist friends, some AD 70 friends, some real... I hope you understand none of the words I'm saying right now. Some realized eschatology. I hope you have no idea what I'm talking about. But I, I've read all the articles, I've watched all the debates, I've thought it all through. It's basically the idea that Jesus isn't coming back, just we all die and go somewhere, and one day the earth gets too close to the sun, the whole thing happens. My faith is not built on that. My faith is built on this. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. I'm in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 50. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. But I tell you a mystery. Behold, we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. If we're alive at the moment, we'll be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable and this 
mortal must put on immortality. Listen to verse 55. Death, where is your victory? Death, where's your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is in the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that's coming. I believe Jesus was raised from the dead, and one day he's coming back, and he's going to raise up everyone else, and it's as sure to me as it is that he was raised. And death will be destroyed, and Satan will be destroyed, and sin will be revealed to be powerless as it ought be now. You know, it's interesting about faithfulness. That comes last in the chapter. Verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why didn't he open with that? Because you can't open with that. You can't. You can try to open with that. You open with your resurrected king and the victory that he enjoys that you want in his name, and then you move forward. We talked about the disciples a little bit. We talked about the love for the disciples, and we talked about the tests that they face, and they didn't do real well with that. But what we learn in the end is that what comes out of it is they got eternal hope and purpose as disciples, and that's what you get. Eternal hope, but not just eternal hope, also eternal purpose. Remember when I was reading in Mark 16 earlier, and he was getting on to the the apostles? He was getting them. He was saying, Come on, guys. I was barely in there a couple of nights, and you totally fell apart on me. I've got to have you snap into it. And he appears to them. By the way, who was at the Joseph sermon Sunday morning? There was one I didn't mention that was kind of neat. Remember when Joseph came forth new, and he was cleaned up, and he was given new clothes, and he sat down, and 10 brothers were presented to him? And then later, they went and got the 11th brother, and he was presented to the ruling Joseph? What we saw in Mark 16 is that 10 apostles came to Jesus, and then later the 11th was brought. But once they witnessed him resurrected, it wasn't about celebration. Listen carefully. It was about, let's get to work. Their purpose was to go out and preach the gospel to all creation. All authority, Jesus said, has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And lo, he said what? What did he say? I'm with you always. How could I not be? What's going to stop me? Is the devil going to stop me? Is he going to try to kill me again? Got a bigger stone for the grave? Nothing can stop me, Jesus tells them. I will be with you always, even to the ends of the age. One more thing I'll say. I mean, you can't fire me now. I'm almost out of here. I was raised on the concept that the Great Commission was limited to the apostles. I completely denounce that position now. It was initiated by the apostles. But as a result of their hope, they went out and they made disciples and they taught the gospel. And in Acts chapter 8, Christians went out and they made disciples and they taught the gospel. And maybe you were here last night. That's what mature Christians do. One of the things I learned by the resurrection of Jesus is that I now have a living hope and also a living work, a purpose. Speak the truth in love. Let me just read Romans 8. You know, we don't get to read Romans 8 enough. I'm not going to read all of Romans 8. Uh, I'll go ahead and uh, put that on on Sean's docket. Why don't you do some Holy Spirit stuff on Romans 8 next week, Sean? I'm going to skip over all the Holy Spirit stuff. Although I was reading it last night, man. It's so rich. It's just beautiful. I want to read the end of Romans 8. And I want you to think about the life you now live by faith. I want you to think about what that empty tomb and his ascension means to you when you hear Romans 8 verses 31 and following. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who intercedes for us. So what does that mean? Let's keep reading. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or COVID or a change in the the Senate? I mean, what's going to do it? Will famine do it? Will nakedness or peril? How about sword? He goes on to say, verse 37, no matter what. In all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loves us. For I am convinced that neither death, he defeated that, nor life, he created that, nor I could go all the way through this list. 
Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depths, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I love verses 35 through 39. I just want you to see that they were born on the heels of verse 34. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, here's what I get to say. By the way, there's an elder at home. He would love for me to tell you this because he always mentions it to me when we study Romans 8. He always says that's a really wonderful list of things that, that cannot separate you from Christ. But did you notice the one person who's not in the list? Yeah. You. Can you believe that? We talked about this Monday night. You're the only one that can mess this thing up. Now, that's really depressing because I know how much I mess up. But it's also hopeful because I'm the only person I can control. If you've not been baptized into Christ, there's not a soul in the world who can stop you tonight. If you're ready to announce your faith and make changes, there's nobody on the planet who can keep you from doing that. And if you're thinking, well, it won't do any good because I'm not good enough. Well, you're getting really close to the gospel when you say that. Because that's the point. We'll never be good enough. That's why he died. To carry the impossible away. Let me give you one final thought here, and we're finally there. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, the resurrection of Jesus. Romans 6. It led me to the commitment to die to sin in his honor. That was our first point on death. It led me to be buried with him in baptism. And now it leads me to a new life with a living king. Romans 6 verses 1 through 4, please. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? That was our first point. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we've been buried with him. That was our second point. Through baptism into death. So that as Christ was raised from the dead, here's our third point, through the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. You say, what does that mean? I say Romans 6, the whole chapter is what that means. Let's just pick up in verse 8. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is a master over him. Verse 11, consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. Do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies or obey its lust. Do not go on presenting the members of your body as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. I love that phrase, instruments of righteousness. It's the cup idea. It was broken. He put it back together. He filled it up and he said, that's a vessel I can use. That's what he thinks when he looks at you. He wouldn't have died for you otherwise. He wouldn't have forgiven your sins otherwise if he didn't have a new plan and a new purpose and a new life and souls to be reached by your life. That's who we are and that's what it means and that's what it means to be raised with Christ. Eternal life, verse 23, in him. So let's look at this. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? The answer will never be yes in the flesh, and yet not a day should pass that it doesn't have some truth to it. Were you there when they nailed him to the cross, when he died by the hands of the people he came to save? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb and the disciples were shattered? Were you there when God raised him from the dead? Sometimes... Sometimes it causes me to tremble. Can't talk. Can't reason. Can't move. Tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? I wanted to leave you with that message more than any other. Because when you're in Scripture and you're connecting to Him and His death, burial, and resurrection is real to you, then if everything he did is real to you, then everything he's going to do is just as real for you. And that's what we need in all of our young people and all of our members here. I am so sure about those three things that I know that he is ruling and I know that he is returning and I know that I'm going to be in heaven with him. 
Something I say at home, it gets me in trouble a little bit. Probably the only thing. Probably not. Do you know? Do you know that you're going to heaven? If I ask you to write down on a card, you're going to need lots of cards tonight, I guess. Give me a percentage. How sure are you you're going to heaven? What number are you going to write down? A lot of pressure, I know. Yeah, it's a good idea. Don't say anything. <laughs> 1 John 5.13 says what? These things have been written so that you might believe that you have eternal life. I'm going to heaven. And anything that gets in the way will have to be stopped, not by my power, but by His. If you're sitting there tonight and you're going, I don't know, I don't think so, I'm not sure, then please, please find yourself in His story. Please find yourself following Him. Death to sin, burial in water, new direction. What's it going to be? If we can help you, come now as we stand and sing.